Well, thank you. Um, pleasure to be here and uh, to get to know you better, Jeffrey. I, Sir Joe, I'm just really uh, happy to have the opportunity to, to, to be here. I hope I can help you. My, uh, my, my topic, uh, interestingly enough, as he listed those five uh, things that are keeping people up at night, uh, this topic might at first appear that it doesn't hit those, but it really hits all of them. And, uh, and so I, I, I hope I can bring some value here today. Um, how many of you uh, have clear mission statements and uh, core values in the place where you work or the place you run? Uh, anybody? Okay. All right. That's good. <coughs> so there's probably not another topic that's been overhyped by consultants uh, more than this one. Uh, and, uh, and so I want to be careful not to do that. <coughs> Beg your pardon. Um, my goal today is to help uh, you recognize, if you don't already, that uh, having a clear mission, vision, values is essential and indispensable for effective leadership, for planning, for execution, for alignment, and for accountability. Uh, all of those things help to sharpen the performance of the company and, uh, and I think you'll see that when I'm done. So those of you who already have a mission, uh, I pray, or uh, I, I, I'm hoping that uh, there'll be enough challenge here for you that, uh, that you'll uh, find something that will help you to sharpen it or, or uh, recommit to it or uh, what, whatever you need to do. And those of you who don't, um, perhaps today would be a good day to start to launch on a, uh, on a project to do that. Um, okay, I know there's a clicker someplace. There it is. Nope. So that's what I should have practiced on. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so the characteristics of a mission uh, have to do with who we are, where we're you know, why do we exist? What's our purpose? So these are the kinds of questions that you can ask to, uh, to help you to develop what really is the mission. You notice why is that important is there several times. And the idea there is to get to the root of what your purpose is. And, uh, and so that would be an exercise to go through if you are starting. And if you have one, uh, you might check yours, re-look re at it and see does it answer those kinds of questions. Um, <clears throat> but establishing, that's a dashboard, I hope it comes out there, the link it might be a little dark, but establishing the clear mission and embracing a worthy purpose uh, is, uh, is just as important for a million dollar company as, as it is for a $500, $500 million dollar company. It's the same, uh, exactly the same things are necessary. We've all got people, products, processes, and, uh, and customers, and money. Those issues are all the same, whether you've got a big company or a small company. And, uh, and so we're, uh, the audience for this topic is very broad, okay? And what we want to do is, uh, is, is, is separate the companies that just bump along because they don't have clarity and uh, create the clarity that, uh, that will separate uh, our company from, from the field in terms of who we are, uh, what we're about, and where we intend to go. <clears throat> Studies have repeatedly, repeatedly shown across all ages and income and education levels that people report a sense of purpose and an opportunity to fulfill fill their God-given potential, people who have that are more likely to live healthy and satisfying lives. And so, obviously that's from a personal perspective, uh, but we can help with that from a business perspective by giving people something bigger than themselves to engage in while they're at work, since they're at work more than they're at home in most cases. <coughs> Excuse me. Our, uh, I guess I don't need this anymore. Um, <clears throat> mission. 
clearly expresses the reason why we're in business. It's timeless, it's short and concise, it's inspirational, it's personal, powerful, and, uh, and, and it can be used as a decision-making tool. So, timeless. Whoops. The, the idea be, behind timeless is that it, it captures the essential and enduring tenets of where, what you're trying to accomplish. It weathers changes in uh, people and technology and all the things that, that change as we as we go through our uh, uh, careers of satisfying customers and eliminating waste. Um, and it's impervious to just what's hot. It, it doesn't, it's not fickle. It, it's clear. And, uh, <clears throat> and we need to remain, that these, the mission needs to remain throughout any or all of these changes. Of course, with the exception that if the business totally changes, you, everybody's heard that uh, we might need to pivot. Uh, you know, you might have to tweak your mission in that sense. But, uh, but timeless. Long, long view. It has to be short and concise. Those of you who raised your hand, and it's about half of you, um, how many of you can recite your mission statement right now? Just stand up and recite it. Hands? Ooh. Okay. Three, four. Okay. It needs to be short. Maybe that's why you can't recite it. And, uh, needs to be concise and, and hard hitting. So it takes some wordsmithing and some attention to, to get it to the place where you can uh, actually use it. Because if uh, those of you who are running the company, uh, if you don't have it memorized, then you probably, you, you may or may not be using it to guide your decisions, but the chances that, uh, that your staff or their direct reports are engaged with the mission is pretty slim. If, uh, if, if you don't, can't recite it, okay? So, next we want to make sure that it's inspirational uh, along those same lines. If, if it doesn't inspire you when you're the owner or the CEO, uh, the likelihood that it will inspire your staff is uh, predictable. Not, not, real, uh, not real likely. So, we need to uh, make sure that our mission is, is inspirational to us first and, uh, and to our organization second. It needs to be personal, uh, from the heart, a commitment, a beacon, that uh, a, a guiding star that everybody can point at to align to accomplish the same thing. And, and finally, a decision-making tool. Um, and what I mean by that is if people know what the mission is, in a lot of cases, they'll be able to make decisions without needing any help from their uh, superiors. Uh, it's a plumb line. There are words to live by. Uh, it, it's not just wallpaper. Somebody made the comment around the table here that uh, a lot of times our mission, vision, core values are posted on the wall in the cafeteria, but they're not really uh, followed. And, uh, and that is really, really a shame. So good mission, good mission statements guide uh, decisions. And here are some three examples of, uh, of mission statements that will do that. Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Ritz Carlton, ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen. Feel the passion in that, and the one I like the best in terms of decision making is uh, Newport News Shipbuilding. Uh, we shall build good ships here, at a profit if we can, at a loss if we must, but always good ships. The purchasing guy is going to know not to cut the corners because his mission is to build good ships. Now he's going to try to cut costs, obviously, but but not cut corners. So what's the impact of all of that? The, uh, <clears throat> there's a Gallup study uh, that, that talks uh, about the value of uh, mission, 
and uh, it's improved retention, improved employee engagement, both of which were on that five point list, right? Higher productivity, which is the profit, and, uh, and improved connection with customers. So I guess that isn't all five of them. I don't remember which one we missed, but there's a big, there's a big hit right there. Um, so what is the value of the mission? As, as employees move beyond the basics of employee engagement, uh, they view their contribution to the organi organization more broadly if they have a clear mission. Uh, they're more likely to stay. They take proactive steps to create a safe environment. They have higher productivity, and they connect with customers to the benefit of the organization. So think of it th this way, the, the, uh, the employee is uh, part of something bigger than himself, so he is happy, he's engaged. As a result of that engagement, uh, he's treating customers better, or at least they are seeing a smile, and, uh, uh, and, and so they get treated and engaged more. Uh, happy customers are willing to come back um, and probably pay a premium in price, Jack. Um, <clears throat> we've been talking about price increases in Jack's business. Um, and the stakeholders uh, place a premium value on the, on the company uh, if it exhibits something greater than itself, versus a, a purpose greater than just profit. So we'll go pretty fast through some of these now. The mission drives loyalty across generations. Uh, more than one in four millennials strongly agree with the statement, if the job market improves in the next 12 months, I will look for a job with a different organization. 25% turnover, okay? So this makes it more important than ever to focus on strengths and mission to drive down the cost of turnover and prevent the loss of key employees. I wouldn't be surprised if that a similar statistic uh, would, would resonate with people who aren't millennials. Although some people uh, are old enough that they don't want to uh, probably change jobs, but they probably, those guys that would have said this when they were younger won't say it now, but they're not really engaged. There's a, there's a very large percent of com companies that are not, or uh, employees that are not engaged with their company. A uh, strong, clear mission fosters customer engagement. Again, according to Gallup, four in 10 employees know what their company stands for and what makes its brand different from its competitors. Four in 10. Those other six guys are just coming in for a paycheck, doing what they've always done, um, but they are not expanding and, and, uh, and pushing the, the brand. So this lack of brand awareness is not a marketing problem. It's a leadership problem. And the leadership starts with a clear mission. Mission improves strategic alignment. Again, clear, defined, focused, purposeful mission statements uh, drive strategic alignment. Now, alignment begins with clear purpose, the what and the why of the organization. It helps people establish and balance their priorities, set their performance goals, and align that the company can align their awards and compensation uh, at all levels relative to performance against the mission. <clears throat> and again, mission en enables clarity. Awareness of the mission guides decision making and judgment as we've already said. A clear sense of what matters most helps leaders determine the best path for the company and helps them set priorities. This clarity inspires conviction and dedication. Again, employee engagement. So what's the conclusion to, uh, to, to this much? Uh, clear core principles actually help release an organization's creative juices to drive continuous improvement and innovation based on a solid foundation. Uh, Well-conceived core principles, we haven't talked about core principles yet, uh, but they're invaluable in selecting our stakeholders, motivating, educating, and correcting them, and providing ongoing alignment, decision-making, and motivation. If stakeholders do, do not share our core values, they will make mistakes, cause conflicts, 
and create people problems. And that's right from my coach's, uh, Gina Whitman's book. <coughs> Closing the gap? No. Get traction. Tra yeah, yeah, traction. I just, uh, this is the, the next one, but at any rate, getting a grip. So over the years with C12, uh, we do an annual, more or less annual leaders conference. And the way we do that, C12 members come in and, and present what they're doing in their company to share with other C12 members to, uh, to help sharpen each other's saws. And uh, this, uh, these companies with undistinguished historical performance uh, who adapt a clear mission statement begin trending upward as people pull together and achieve a shared vision plan and related goals. Uh, and then of course recognition and celebration re reinforces the momentum. Employees gain confidence, begin to grasp a more integrated sense of what they're trying to do and how best to do it based on the firm's core principles. And they're able to celebrate the fruit of their actions. Again, a leadership, uh, a leadership issue that translates to, to employee performance. Um, so what's a vision statement? A vision statement states clearly what your business will look like when the mission is complete, which is even farther on, right? Ronald Reagan says to grasp and hold a vision, to fix it in your senses, that is the very essence of leadership. <coughs> So there's a lot of overlap between mission and vision. If you go, if you hear a speaker this afternoon, uh, he might actually even reverse the, the uh, definitions. But in any case, uh, if, at least for our purposes, we want both. The mission tells you what you're doing. The vision says what it looks like when it's done. And, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a picture that should excite us in terms of what's, uh, what's been accomplished. Uh, Jim Collins, coined of uh, acronym B, BHAG, B -H -A -G, the big, hairy, audacious goal. And, uh, and that kind of represents what we're talking about here as the, uh, as the vision. The essence of the vision is it, it makes us stretch. It's, it's big, audacious, beyond our ability to, to achieve without some super uh, effort and a lot of engagement falls outside of our com comfort zone, and it's probably a little risky, but uh, that's okay. It's where we're, where we're trying to take it. The vision also evokes passion and conviction, just, just like we described in the mission statement, uh, but here we've created a picture of the future that is so grand that, uh, that people really want to be engaged in it, and they, they want to uh, they're motivated and it drives them to want to follow the mission to accomplish the vision. Here are some examples of that. This is, you probably can't even read that from there. GE, their vision was to become number one or number two in every market we serve and revolutionize the company to have the speed and agility of a small enterprise. Nike, to experience the emotions of winning and crushing the competition. Disney, to deliver with integrity the most consistently exceptional entertainment experiences. Well, that brings us to core values. <coughs> I think of core values kind of as the, uh, the rules of the game. Whereas the mission is the, the, uh, the end zone, maybe, but the, the uh, core values define who we are and, and how we'll do our work. Um, our, our employees, our suppliers, our clients want to know what they're signing up for. And uh, with these things in mind, our company's core principles must be compelling to truly shape the actions of the company and the stakeholders must be understood by all the team members the same way we understand them. Consequently, we need to reinforce them, and, and we might sound like a broken record, but that's okay, because everybody needs to understand the leader's passion and commitment to the, the core values. It needs to be embraced and owned by the team members as their vision for the business. 
and it needs to be reinforced by communicating over and over again, which I just did. Repeat that one. Um, furthermore, our core values need to transcend. Um, this is a little bit like timeless, only it's more so. They need to transcend the circumstances. Our core values are the things that wouldn't change if, if we were in a different business. Our core values would be the same. Uh, we need to be committed enough to it that uh, if, if, if it didn't benefit us anymore, if the market <clears throat> began to, uh, to not reward us for whatever the core value is, then uh, we would still hold it. Okay? That's, that's, how we're, that's what we're talking about, about core. Um, can you imagine 10, 20, 30 years out still believe in what you put in your core principles? They need to be so fundamental, you would keep them regardless of whether they're rewarded. Okay. We don't need very many core values. In fact, a lot of companies uh, have more than they need. In fact, I was just reading again in Get a Grip, uh, where Gina Wickman uh, refers to Patrick Lencioni, uh, that there are three values traps. So when you're creating your core values, um, there are some things that don't need to be on that list because they're really not core and you need to uh, things. So, so one of the mistakes we can make is to make the core values aspirational. So we're not really that good yet at whatever customer satisfaction or whatever we want that, that core value to be. But that's where we want to go. So Let's all aspire to get there. Now, the danger, you know, that, that's, that's maybe good from a motivation standpoint, but it's not good uh, in terms of accountability and discipline in the organization because the boss doesn't do that. They're all aspiring to it, so it's not really, it's not core. It's, it's something you want to be, but it's not something that you are. Uh, there are also something that these guys call permission to play values. Uh, and, and I looked at this and I uh, know what the companies are. Integrity, for example, uh, is, has a core value. Well, maybe that is a uh, price of entry. Don't we all need to have integrity if we're going into business? So, so that in, in order to even be in business, some core values And then there are accidental core values. And uh, an accidental core value is something that, for example, the uh, founder may have had, like our entrepreneurial spirit. But you know, the, the company is a $5 million company. You don't want everybody in the company to have an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, at least I don't think you do. Um, you, can't have, you can't have a whole field of visionaries in your business. You've got to have some people that are work. So, so the entrepreneurial spirit might be what launched the company, but it's probably not still a core value that you want everyone in the company to, to own and, and to own to. So, uh, I'm sure there are other accidental core values, but that's the one that kind of seemed like a brand new true to me. So when we had that, uh, Roy Disney,
there's an employee that's struggling in terms of performance. There's the highly talented employee. There's the guy that's been uh, a long-term employee, been around for quite a while. And then there's a senior position, um, somebody that's in a leadership position that's also been there. Okay? So we're going to go down the list and talk uh, just about the Unclear. Let's do the right hand count first. Jot down. What do you think the new hire is thinking, experiencing? Um, you know, where where is his head in a in an organization that has unclear mission, vision, and core values? Ed. Stay off the radar here. 
keep my head down. Exactly. And so his performance is passive, it's mediocre. He might say something like, I just work here. Right? And he's calmed down the days. Okay, now we have a, uh, actually let's put this up there. Now we have a senior position. This guy is not only long term, but now he has a staff level chief um, C suite kind of a position. Uh, what's he think? Maybe? He's keeping all the and Exactly. Exactly. It's the people's problem. And how is he feeling emotionally? He's got nothing but people problems. He's stressed, he's frustrated, and he probably is coming down the days too. Well, that's someone who hired into the senior level position, who's um, probably older, but it's someone who worked himself up into the senior position, you have to question his values and ethics on what he had to do to get up. Oh, boy, that's deep. That's good, right? That's good. That's good. Yeah. But also, So chances are, now that you mention that, uh, we don't have long-term employees as a company hasn't <laughs> been around that long by the time this all plays out. But, uh, but maybe, maybe, but you're right. They, uh, we, we had quite a discussion here in our CFO meeting this month about delegation. And there's two issues with it. One is the guy you just described that insists on seeing everything because he doesn't trust anybody and he can't trust them because he didn't give them clear direction and he has cultivated a uh, mature culture. But also in that culture, the other thing that happens is people pass stuff up to him even if he didn't ask for it because they, they don't know. You know I, I don't know what to do, so I guess I have to ask the boss. So there's stuff waiting for his approval all the way through the, the, uh, the chain, uh, chain of command, because uh, people don't know what to do with it. And uh, so he, he might be the kind of guy, if he's a little, a little bit ambitious, that walks around uh, you know, talking with suppliers and customers and, and, uh, and employees in particular, and, uh, and, and the employees, you know, that's how he uncovers some of the stuff that's not being dealt with. And so then he, then he does take it on himself and promises to get back with him, right? So, so we've got upward delegation going on, and we've got uh, you know, the, the, the bonehead thinking of, I have to do it because nobody else is, is uh, credible. So that's a pretty ugly organization. Probably nobody in here is suffering from all that, but <clears throat> I hope. But to some degree, I think maybe everybody has some of this, unless you really, really hold in and focus down your core. That was the issue. All right, so slipped into the, uh, the purposeful company. I guess I'm just about out of time, so we'll do this really fast. Um, the opposite of everything we just said, right? The, the, the new hire feels welcome. It feels like he's learning. Is motivated, maybe even inspired because he buys into the vision. And he probably, if you're hired about him, he's probably diligent at, at going after whatever he's been asked to do. Uh, the struggling employee, there are probably fewer of them in this organization, but somebody might be struggling. But he probably feels hopeful and guided and supported because his supervisor knows what to ask of him. And is, uh, is staying out. Now he might struggle some more, and he might be in the wrong place. And so then we'll, uh, with our values here, is in a, in a Christian forum, we're going to help him get where he needs to be. If 
we can't help him with the plan over here, then, then this might not be the place that God wants to go. Uh, or the highly talented guy is an integral part. He feels trusted, he's focused, and he stays excited. Everybody buying this? We got a little less integrated. Interactive here, but um, in the interest of time. The long term guy is loyal, he's fulfilled, he's satisfied, he's effective, he knows what he's supposed to do, he's been doing a long time, he's really good. And the senior guy is in a position of teaching, giving back, and finishing strong. So that's the impact of having clear vision with the combatants. Have that be the purposeful company there in the close time. So, I, I hope this has been more than a review for you. A lot of people uh, roll their eyes when they think about mission and vision, and, and, uh, and a lot of companies have taught their people to roll their eyes because they aren't clear and, uh, and concise in all of the things that we just said, but I hope I made the case that they're useful and indispensable clear mission, vision, and foregoing is indispensable for effective leadership, for planning, for execution, for alignment, and for accountability. So, again, if you already have a mission, I trust that you will go home and try to sharpen it, uh, or, or if, you're, uh, if you're not the owner or CEO, go home and try to get, get the leadership team to, to think this way. Uh, and if not, then, uh, then I hope if you're making notes about how do you want to go about launching such a thing? Um, so, now, the, uh, the next thing I've been asked to do is to give you my testimony, which uh, which oftentimes is a story of how God saved a, a person from addiction or jail or uh, some uh, exciting situation like that. I, I don't my my story is not exciting in that way. Assad. Hey, let's see. Um, my story is that I grew up in the church. And so I kind of was on the inside track. When I was 13 or so we had a confirmation class and the, and the confirmation teacher was Pastor's wife who was just very spirit-filled and, uh, and compassionate to us rowdy junior high boys. And, uh, and she convinced some of us, everybody didn't buy it, but, uh, but I did, that she convinced me to read my Bible every day. So I began at that age, 12, 13 years old, reading some Bible every morning. And, uh, and at some point in that window of confirmation time, I uh, recognize that there's a decision I got to make. I can't just be a Christian because my folks are Christians. I have to be make a decision for myself. So I came to a place where I believed uh, God, and uh, and I confessed with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, and and I believed in my heart that God raised Him from the dead. So I was saved. Um, I continued to read my Bible every day, and I think the, the maybe the most exciting thing about my testimony is that uh, uh, even with my uh, depraved thoughts that might have led me down the wrong path, God saved me from all that stuff. Anyway, you know, where would I be without the Lord? Uh, but the most exciting thing is that I got in the habit of reading my Bible every day. And with few exceptions, like my first year of college, I, uh, I, I've been reading my Bible pretty much every day. And, uh, and as a result, uh, he has sharpened me and walked with me and, and convinced me that uh, he's for me and he's for you. And, uh, and he promises to work all things out for good for those of us who love him and are trying to walk according to his purpose. And so I had a confidence that I would probably not otherwise have had. Uh, I might have been able to develop self-confidence uh, like we try to teach our generation today. But uh, 
I'm, I'm pleased that I have God confidence because people who are self-confident and eventually they wear down because things don't always go well. Um, but God has walked with me through some pretty miserable situations. Um, in fact, I saw a counselor a, a while back <coughs> over a uh, essentially a divorce situation. And when I told him the story, he said, that's appalling. I can't even imagine going through what you went through. And, uh, and I don't understand why you're not in the puddle on the floor. So I had some things to deal with. But uh, the point is God was with me through that and actually strengthened my faith in it. And, uh, and he worked it out for good. My, my daughters uh, serve the Lord, uh, praise God. And I have a fine wife and, uh, of 25 years now. And uh, so he worked it out for good. And he works everything out for good. That's, that's why we've come to, to, uh, to, to, to re rehearse the phrase when things go bad. Uh, I can hardly wait to see what God's going to do with this. <laughs> right? He's going to work it out. So that's kind of my story. I, I, uh, I wanted to share that uh, I had a best friend in high school and college. And he's still probably my best friend. Um, and when we were in school together, I believe that he had the same experiences. I that he was at a different church, he was an altar boy or acolyte or you know whatever, and he taught children Sunday school and so on. So I figured we were like-minded. Um, we drifted apart for a few years, but uh, in, when he was 40, uh, or 40 or so, 40-ish, uh, he had an encounter again with the Bible. Um, it's kind of funny, but I don't have time to tell you that part of the story. But uh, he had an encounter with the Bible, and he decided, this has to be true. You know, he researched where it came from, how it was preserved, and all these things, and read it, and it made sense. 66 books all tied together. That's really pretty amazing, considering they were written over a span of uh, several thousand, or a couple of thousand years, anyway. Um, so, at any rate, he became a Christian at that time, or, or, or at least he probably was a Christian before that. But he was kind of missing out on walking with Jesus for 25 years, 30 or so, uh, because he wasn't committed and, and actually walking a life of, uh, of faith. So I'm pleased to say that, uh, that today he and I are both walking out Ephesians 2.10, uh, where God prepared in advance things for us to do. And uh, before we were even born, he had a plan for work that I should be walking in. And, uh, and so we're, we're doing that, and, uh, and what a privilege it is to, to be able to commune with God as, as we walk. So I would encourage you, if you're not reading your Bible every day, please do, uh, for, for your sake, uh, for the sake of your children. Uh, just let God speak to you and uh, engage with Him in prayer. Practice His presence. And I think that uh, you know, in, in, a, in a few months, uh, you will detect an uh, amazing change in, in your life. So that's my challenge to you. I'm done. Thank you for watching this presentation. Perhaps you've never made a Christian commitment. We want to give you that opportunity today. Just a few easy steps. First of all, recognize your need. The Bible tells us that in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners and must recognize our need for a Savior. By confessing our sins and turning from them, we will find forgiveness. The Bible promises in 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous 
to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Believe in Jesus. God wrought a miracle when he sent his only son to die that we might have life. Put your faith in him and believe in his power to save you. The Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God has given us a great gift in his Son, but we must receive this gift. Thank him for loving and forgiving you and ask him to live in your heart. His promise to us is clear. In John 1.12, the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So Jesus is the atonement, the sacrificial lamb, the remission of sins, just as if we'd never sinned, and the forgiveness. Through Jesus, we have daily forgiveness. And having received his salvation, confess your faith. The Bible assures us in Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, we're all going to die and spend eternity somewhere, either in heaven or in hell. We want to give you the opportunity to pray with us today. Let's bow our head. Lord, I recognize my need for you as my Savior. I confess my sins to you now and I turn from them, and I ask for your forgiveness, Lord. I believe in you, Lord Jesus, that you died for me, that I might have eternal life with you in heaven. Lord Jesus, I receive you now in my heart, and I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you receive me into your kingdom. I believe in my heart that you are my Lord and that God raised you from the dead, that I might be saved and spend eternity with you. I thank you, Lord, that I am now part of God's family and I commit my life to you from this day forward. Amen. And if you've prayed that prayer with us, we encourage you to share that with someone today. Thank you.